Right, good afternoon. Um, in light of the length of the report, the statement that I make will be uh, fairly long. Um, but after the statement is ended, then I'm happy to stay and take questions for as long as you want to ask them. The decision to go to war in Iraq and to remove Saddam Hussein from power in a coalition of over 40 countries led by the United States of America was the hardest, most momentous, most agonizing decision I took in my 10 years as British Prime Minister. For that decision today, I accept full responsibility without exception and without excuse. I recognize the division felt by many in our country over the war, and in particular, I feel deeply and sincerely in a way that no words can properly convey the grief and suffering of those who lost ones they loved in Iraq whether members of our armed forces, the armed forces of other nations, or Iraqis. The intelligence assessments made at the time of going to war turned out to be wrong. The aftermath turned out to be more hostile, protracted, and bloody than ever we imagined. The coalition planned for one set of ground facts and encountered another and a nation whose people we wanted to set free and secure from the evil of Saddam became instead victim to sectarian terrorism. For all of this, I express more sorrow, regret, and apology than you may ever know or can believe. Only two things I cannot say. It's claimed by some that by removing Saddam we caused the terrorism today in the Middle East and that it would have been better to have left him in power. I profoundly disagree. Saddam was himself a wellspring of terror, a continuing threat to peace, and to his own people. If he had been left in power in 2003, then I believe he would once again have threatened world peace and when the Arab revolutions of 2011 began, he would have clung to power with the same deadly consequences that we see in the carnage in Syria today. Whereas at least in Iraq, for all its challenges, we have today a government that is elected, is recognized as internationally legitimate, and is fighting terrorism with the support of the international community. The world was and is, in my judgment, a better place without Saddam Hussein. Secondly, I will never agree that those who died or were injured made their sacrifice in vain. They fought in the defining global security struggle of the 21st century against the terrorism and violence, which the world over destroys lives, divides communities, and their sacrifice should always be remembered with thanksgiving and with honor when that struggle is eventually won as it will be. I know some of the families cannot and do not accept this is so. I know there are those who can never forget or forgive me for the having taken this decision and who think that I took it dishonestly. As the report makes clear, there were no lies. Parliament and Cabinet were not misled. There was no secret commitment to war 
intelligence was not falsified and the decision was made in good faith. However, I accept that the report makes serious criticisms of the way decisions were taken. And again, I accept full responsibility for these points of criticism, even where I do not fully agree with them. I do not think it is fair or accurate to criticize the armed forces, the intelligence services, or the civil service. It was my decision they were acting upon. The armed forces in particular did an extraordinary job throughout our engagement in Iraq in the incredibly difficult mission we gave them. I pay tribute to them. Any faults derived from my decisions and should not attach to them. They are people of enormous dedication and courage and the country should be very proud of them. Today is therefore the right moment to go back, however, and look at the history of that time so that those, even if they passionately disagree, will at least understand why I did what I did and learn lessons so that we do better in the future. First, why was Saddam a threat? My premiership changed completely on the 11th of September 2001. 9-11 was the worst terrorist atrocity in history. Over 3,000 people died that day in America, including many British people, making it the worst ever loss of life of our own country's citizens from any single terror attack. In fact, 9-11 was not, of course, the first attack. Prior to then, 23 countries had suffered terrorist attacks of this nature. In 2002, 20 different nations lost people to terrorism. For over 20 years as well, the regime of Saddam had become a notorious source of conflict and bloodshed in the Middle East. He had attempted a nuclear weapons program only halted by a preventive strike by the Israeli military in 1981. He used chemical weapons in the war he began with Iran, a war which lasted seven years with around a million casualties. Out of the Iranian experience came Iran's own nuclear weapons program. He invaded Kuwait in 1990. He used chemical weapons extensively against his own people. For example, in the massacre of Alabja, where thousands died in a single day. The international community made frequent attempts to bring him into compliance with UN resolutions, calling for him to give up his programs. As at March 2003, he was in breach of no fewer than 17 such UN resolutions. In 1998, following the ejection of UN weapons inspectors from Iraq, President Clinton and I authorized military strikes on his facilities. And from that point, regime change in Iraq became the official policy of the US administration. In a country where a majority of Iraqis are Shia Muslims and 20% of the population Kurds, he ruled with an unparalleled brutality with a government drawn almost exclusively from the Sunni 20% minority, though many of his victims were also Sunni. Saddam was not the only developer of weapons of mass destruction. Libya had a program. North Korea was trying to obtain nuclear technology. The network of the Pakistani scientist A.Q. Khan was an active proliferator of such technology and Iran's program had begun. But only one regime had actually used such weapons, that of Saddam. Intelligence still valid indicated Al-Qaeda wanting to acquire such material and 9-11 showed that they were prepared to cause mass casualties. So it's important, now that we're here 15 years after 9-11, to recall the atmosphere at that time. America had never suffered such an attack on its own soil before. Its population were devastated. They regarded themselves at war. The Taliban, who had given sanctuary to Al-Qaeda, had been removed from power in Afghanistan in November 2001. But the 2002 Bali bombings in which over 200 victims, mainly Australians, lost their lives, showed the continuing threat. All Western nations were changing their security posture. We were in a new world. 
And at that time, we did not know where the next attack, threat, or danger would come from. The fear of the US administration, which I shared, was of the possibility of terrorist groups acquiring, either by accident or by design, chemical weapons, biological weapons, or even a primitive nuclear device. The report accepts that after 9-11, the calculus of risk changed fundamentally. We believed we had to change policy on nations developing such weapons in order to eliminate the possibility of WMD and terrorism coming together. Saddam's regime was the place to start, not because he represented the only threat, but because his was the only regime actually to have used such weapons. There were outstanding UN resolutions in respect of him, and his record of bloodshed suggested he was capable of aggressive, unpredictable, catastrophic actions. In addition, the UN sanctions imposed on Iraq were crumbling and therefore containment was faltering. The final Iraq survey report, which was conducted into Saddam's WMD program and ambitions after the Iraq war and whose findings are accepted in this report, found that Saddam did indeed intend to go back to developing the programs after the removal of sanctions. So I asked people to put themselves in my shoes as Prime Minister. Back then, barely more than a year from 9-11, in late 2002 and early 2003, you're seeing the intelligence mount up on WMD. You're doing so in a changed context of mass casualties caused by a new and virulent form of terrorism. You have at least to consider the possibility of a 9-11 here in Britain. And your primary responsibility as Prime Minister is to protect your country. These were my considerations at the time. The lead up to war, there was no rush to war. The inquiry rightly dismisses the conspiracy th theory that I pledged Britain unequivocally to military action at Crawford, Texas in April 2002. I did not and could not, as they explicitly in their report conclude. I was absolutely clear publicly and privately, however, that we would be with the USA in dealing with this issue. And I made that clear in the note to President Bush of the 28th of July, 2002. But I also said we had to proceed in the right way. And I set out the conditions necessary, especially that we should then go down the UN route and avoid precipitate action as indeed the inquiry report finds. So, as again the inquiry finds, I persuaded a reluctant American administration to take the issue back to the UN. This resulted in the November 2002 UN Resolution 1441, giving Saddam, I quote, a final opportunity to come into, I quote, full and immediate compliance with UN resolutions and to cooperate fully with UN inspectors. Any non-compliance, was defined as a material breach. Finally, and only under threat of military action, Saddam permitted inspectors to return. But his cooperation was neither full nor immediate. See the report of the inspectors to the UN in January 2003 and that of the 7th of March 2003, again referred to in the body of the report. However, by then, there was substantial disagreement in the UN Security Council. America wanted action. President Putin and the leadership of France did not. In a final attempt to bridge the division, I agreed with the inspectors a set of six tests based on Saddam's non-compliance, with which he had to comply immediately, which included things like interviews with those responsible for his program, and which up to then had been refused, except in country where obviously these people would be subject to intimidation. So this, these six tests were drawn up in a resolution accompanied by an ultimatum. The non-compliance would result in military action. So again, I had secured American agreement to a new resolution setting tests, which if he had passed, would have avoided military action. But the United States understandably insisted that in the event of continued failure, the UN had to be clear that action would follow. And this was the approach rejected by Saddam. The Americans in the UK and other partners 
from over 40 nations had assembled a force in the Gulf ready for military action. President Bush made it clear he was going to act. The British government, under my leadership, chose to be part of that action, a decision endorsed by Parliament, with the leaders of the opposition being given access to exactly the same intelligence and advice presented to me. Now, the inquiry finds that as at the 18th of March, war was not, and I quote, the last resort. But given the impasse at the UN and the insistence of the United States for reasons I completely understood, and with hundreds of thousands of troops in theater, which could not be kept there indefinitely, it was the last moment of decision for us, as the report indeed accepts. By then, the US was going to war and to move with us or without us. Now, the inquiry finds that going to war without a majority of the UN Security Council in agreement undermined the authority of the UN. The reality is that we, Britain, had continually tried to act with the authority of the UN. I successfully convinced the Americans to go back to the UN in November 2002, as I said, and after the initial conflict, it was again Britain which put UN authority back in place for the aftermath so that from June 2003, British troops were in Iraq with full UN authority. However, as at the 18th of March, there was gridlock at the UN. In Resolution 1441, it had been agreed to give Saddam one final opportunity to comply. It was accepted he had not done so. In that case, according to 1441, action should have followed. It didn't because by then, politically, there was an impasse. I say the undermining of the UN was in fact the refusal to follow through on 1441. And with the subsequent statement from President Putin and the President of France that they would veto any new resolution authorizing action in the event of non-compliance, it was clearly not possible to get a majority of the UN to agree a new resolution. As the then President of Chile explained, there was no point since any decision by a majority would be vetoed. So, on the 18th of March, and this is the vital thing to understand, given especially what Sir John said this morning. We had come to the point of binary decision. Right to remove Saddam or not, with America or not. The report itself says this was a stark choice. And it was. Now, the inquiry claims that military action was not a last resort, though it also says it might have been necessary later. With respect, I didn't have the option of that delay. I had to decide. I thought of Saddam, his record, the character of his regime. I thought of our alliance with America, and it's important to us in the post 9-11 world, and I weighed it carefully. I took this decision with the heaviest of hearts. I had already, as the inquiry finds, consulted our armed forces and received their commitment to be part of it and their view that we should be part of it. If you read my private notes to President Bush from March 2002 onwards, you will see my caution, my recognition. This, is, this was not like Kosovo or Afghanistan and my desire to do this at all peacefully. But as of the 17th of March 2003, there was no middle way. No further time for deliberation, no room for more negotiation. A decision had to be taken. And it was mine to take as Prime Minister. I took it. I accept full responsibility for it. I stand by it. I only ask with humility that the British people accept that I took this decision because I believe that it was the right thing to do based on the information that I had and the threats I perceived. And that my duty as Prime Minister at that moment in time in 2003 was to do what I thought was right, however imperfect the situation or indeed the process. And moments of crisis such as this, 
It's the profound obligation of the person leading the government of our country to take responsibility and to decide. Not to hide behind politics, expediency or even emotion, but to recognise that it is a privilege above all others to lead this nation, but the accompaniment of that privilege when the interests of our nation are so supremely and plainly at stake is to lead and not to shy away, to decide and not to avoid decision, to discharge that responsibility and not to duck it. Neither history nor the fierce and raucous conduct of modern politics with all its love of conspiracy theories and its willingness and addiction to believe in the worst of everyone should falsify my motive in this. I knew it was not a popular decision. I knew what its cost might be politically, though that shrinks into complete insignificance beside the human cost. I did it because I thought it was right and because I thought the human cost of inaction, of leaving Saddam in power, would be greater for us and for the world in the longer term. So the action commenced on the 18th of March. In less than two months, American and British armed forces and those of other nations successfully deposed Saddam. And that part of the campaign, which was, after all, a major part of our strategic objectives, was brilliantly conducted by our military, and we should never forget that. In June 2003, a UN resolution was agreed, putting the coalition forces in charge of helping the country to a new constitution with UN support and under a UN mandate. In August 2003, the UN mission had to withdraw, however, following the bombing of the UN headquarters in Baghdad by Al-Qaeda. And in 2004, the country slid into chaos and instability, especially following the Al-Qaeda bombing of the Samara Shia Mosque. A state of near civil war continued until the surge of American forces began in 2007, which restored the country to relative calm. In 2010, a largely peaceful election in which the party with the most votes was a non-sectarian coalition was held. And in 2010, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was effectively defeated. In 2011, the Arab Spring began. The remnant of AQ Iraq left for Syria, built its base in Raqqa, and then came back over the border into Iraq, renamed as ISIS, <coughs> and helped by the sectarian nature of the Maliki government, exploited the situation in Iraq and created what we see today. We should never forget that as a result of the removal of Saddam in 2003, Libya agreed to yield up its nuclear and chemical weapons program. This led to the complete destruction of a program under international inspection, which turned out to be much more advanced than we knew, and which had it remained in the hands of Gaddafi, would have itself posed a serious threat the AQ car network was shut down. I come to our alliance with America. <clears throat> Whilst the inquiry accepted that it was my prerogative as Prime Minister to decide to be with the United States in military action, the inquiry questions whether this was really necessary and the importance I attached to the alliance. 9-11 was an event like no other in US history. I considered it an attack on all the free world. I believe that Britain as America's strongest ally should be with them in tackling this new and unprecedented security challenge. I believed it important that America was not alone, but part of a wider coalition. In the end, even a majority of European Union nations supported action in Iraq. I do not believe that we would have had that coalition or indeed persuaded the Bush administration to go down the UN path without our commitment to be alongside them in this fight. Throughout my time as Prime Minister, first with the Clinton administration and then with the Bush one, Britain was recognised as the United States' foremost ally. It served us well in Kosovo and allowed us to protect more innocent people than we could have alone. We were America's core partner in the post-9-11 world. 
and I believe that was right. I believe there are two essential pillars to British foreign policy, our alliance with the United States and our partnership in Europe, and we should keep both strong as a vital national interest. Now, people can disagree with that, but that was my judgment as Prime Minister. I come to Saddam and weapons of mass destruction. For more than half a decade, I've always apologized for the inaccurate intelligence, in particular for the intelligence that Saddam had a stockpile of chemical weapons. The inquiry endorses the findings of both the Hutton inquiry and the Butler inquiry that there is no evidence that intelligence was improperly included in the September 2002 dossier or that number 10 improperly influenced the text. But though it makes no finding of impropriety, it finds that the intelligence had not established beyond doubt that Saddam possessed WMD. I only ask that people read the reports given to me, first in March 2002 and then in September 2002, and on many other occasions, for example, in the note written by my senior advisor days before military action. In hindsight, we may know that some of this information was not correct, but I had to act on the information I had at the time. I would point out two other things. First, that virtually every intelligence agency had reached the same conclusion and for very good reasons. Saddam's previous use of weapons, his complete disregard for the mass destruction of human life, and the eviction of UN inspectors in 1998. Secondly, it is essential to consider the findings of the Iraq survey group conducted by a leading UN weapons inspector with 1,400 people in his team. This was done after the war in 2004 on the basis of interviews, including with Saddam himself and his leading officials. The very interviews denied the inspectors in 2003. It's right to read that report because it is authoritative. The inquiry itself calls it significant. But with respect to them, they never explain its significance. The survey group finds that Saddam's priority in the late 1990s and in 2001 to 2003 was to get sanctions lifted. But once they were lifted, they find it was his intent to reconstitute his program since he believed it to be essential to his personal and political survival. Above all, this survey group report finds that he intended to go back to a nuclear program, fearing the Iranian development of nuclear weapons and that he kept his teams and capability to develop those and chemical weapons once sanctions were removed. Now, of course, we can never know whether he would have done this. But I ask, if you knew that for a fact this dictator had used chemical weapons on his own people and those of other nations, for a fact he had lied about having them so he could continue to produce and use them, and for a fact that he had killed thousands of his own people and those in other countries with no respect whatever for human life or norms of civilized behavior, would you have wanted to take that risk of leaving him in place or would you want to eliminate it? Saddam, in my view, was going to pose a threat for as long as he was in power. Now, the planning and the aftermath. The inquiry makes several criticisms of the planning process for the aftermath of the invasion. I accept that, especially in hindsight, we should have approached the situation differently. These criticisms are significant. They include failures to seek assurances of better planning from the American side, which I accept should have been sought. The failures in American planning are well documented and accepted. I do note, nonetheless, that the inquiry fairly and honestly admit that they have not, even after this passage of time, been able to identify alternative approaches which would have guaranteed greater success. And this, I would suggest, is for the very simple reason that the terrorism we faced and did not expect would have been difficult in any circumstances to counter. This is the lesson we learn from other conflict zones, especially Libya, Syria, Yemen, but others also. Our planning proceeded on the basis of those risks of which we were principally warned, namely the possibility of a humanitarian disaster, the use of WMD by Saddam, resistance from the regime, and the challenges of reconstruction. In the event, though the report does not deal with this in detail, 
The real problems were those caused by terrorism and from quarters we did not expect. Al-Qaeda, whose attacks on the UN, on reconstruction, on the Shia population, tipped the country to the brink of civil war in 2004 to 2006. IED attacks and other acts of terrorism from the Shia militia, supported by Iran. The inquiry does find that there were warnings about sectarian fighting and bloodletting. I accept that. But I would point out that nowhere were these highlighted as the main risk. And in any event, what we faced was not the anticipated internal bloodletting, but an all-out insurgency stimulated by external arms and money. We also no now know that the Assad regime in Syria was deliberately sending terrorists across the border to cause terror and instability. And this had a major impact on the coalition's ability to make progress in the country. In short, we ended up fighting exactly the same elements that we're fighting everywhere in the world today from the same origins, Shia extremism on the one hand and Sunni extremism on the other. The consequence was that as we were trying to rehabilitate the country, those elements were trying to wreck our efforts by sectarian violence, and that is what we did not foresee. The inquiry finds that in particular in January 2003, there were no full options papers presented to Cabinet. I note that Cabinet alone debated Iraq 26 times in the run-up to conflict. There were 28 meetings of the ad hoc committee with relevant ministers present. However, I accept I could have and should have insisted on the presentation of a formal options paper to Cabinet. I come to the legality. The report does not make a finding on the legal judgment of the then Attorney General. There are very good reasons for not disputing it. The whole negotiating history of Resolution 1441 in the UN made it clear that the US and the UK had always refused language that obliged the second resolution. The defining of the obligations of Iraq and the agreement that failure fully and immediately to comply was a material breach was a reasonable basis for action. The advice of the Attorney General was in line with that of other law officers and other nations and distinguished legal experts, though I fully acknowledge and respect that others took a different view. Where the politics is hotly contested, the law will be also. I understand why the inquiry finds that the process of coming to the legal opinion was far from satisfactory, but it does not alter the legal conclusion. It was after the detailed meetings the Attorney General had with US and UK officials explaining the negotiating history of 1441 that he came to the view that it was not necessary for a second resolution. On the 27th of February, he gave that view orally. On the 7th of March, he provided that advice in writing. I accept in retrospect it would have been better to have provided the full written advice to Cabinet that this was not the legal precedent and any event was not requested by the Cabinet. I accept there is a case for providing it to Parliament. But none of these matters of process alter the fact that his advice in the end was clear and is not challenged by the inquiry. The inquiry, at one point, says there was no indication of why I gave my view to the Attorney General that Saddam as at the 13th of March 2003 was a material breach of 1441. As the Attorney General has explained, my view was not legally necessary since 1441 had determined what constituted a breach. But nonetheless, he sought my confirmation of what I thought. Saddam was accepted by everyone, including the inspectors, not to be fully complying. He had a long history of deception. The whole basis of my six tests was to address the failure to comply. Indeed, intelligence that is still considered valid shows Saddam at the time in breach of UN resolutions instructing his officials to remove any evidence of WMD or programs for its development. The issue was rather whether despite the breach, he should be given more time. I accept, of course, it is better politically if the Security Council makes such a determination but by then, given the position in the Security Council with a fundamental disagreement, it was clear there would be no agreement irrespective of the circumstances. I come to this important point. Is the world safer or less safe as a result of the removal of Saddam in 2003? The report never deals with this issue in specific terms. But again, with respect to inquiry, this issue has to be debated if we are to reach a conclusion on the wisdom of the judgment I made. I ask that fair-minded people at least consider the following. 
If we had withdrawn the threat of action in 2003 and pulled back our forces, we would have found it almost impossible to reassemble those forces in that number. Now, Sir John says today that it might have been necessary to take military action later. He accepts that. But I don't see how we would have reassembled that force. Sanctions would have swiftly eroded over time, I would suggest. It would have been hard to have kept an invasive process of inspection in place. So Saddam would have remained and immensely politically strengthened. Plus, he would have had the benefit of $100 a barrel oil. This is where the Iraq survey group is so important. It indicates that he would have resumed his earlier development of nuclear and chemical weapons. If that is conceivable, as it surely is, then his removal avoided what would otherwise have been an unacceptable risk, in my judgment. I acknowledge completely and I respect the other point of view. I simply ask that people respect my point of view and the judgment I took on the facts I had at the time. We then come to the state of Iraq today because it's still engaged in conflict, a conflict that goes on all over the Middle East. But to those who say, but for the action in 2003, Iraq will be peaceful in 2016, I ask them to consider the following. There is no doubt that the sectarian policies of the Maliki government contributed to the renewed conflict in Iraq. But the decisive event of the last five years in the Middle East is the Arab Spring, which began in 2011. Starting in Tunisia, regimes across North Africa and the Middle East were toppled or put under sustained attack. In the case of Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, and Yemen, the regimes fell. Then in early 2011, the revolt of the Syrian people against the Assad regime began. In Syria, as with the Saddam regime in Iraq, effectively a small minority ruled the majority on sectarian lines. Except in this case, in the case of Syria with the Sunni in the majority. Between 2003 and 2011, by the way, all of those regimes had remained in power. Not one of them had changed. So supposing Saddam had stayed in power in 2003, I ask this counterfactual. Is it likely that he would still have been in power in 2011, when the Arab Spring began? Is it likely that the Iraqi people would have joined the Arab Spring when all the countries were part of it, and this was the most tyrannical regime of any of them, with the vast majority of people excluded from power? And is it likely that if the Iraqi people had revolted, if there had been an uprising, that he would have reacted like Assad in Syria? Surely it's at least possible that the answer to all of those questions is affirmative. In that case, the nightmare of Syria today would also be happening in Iraq, except with the Shia-Sunni balance inverted. Consider the consequences of that. Even if you disagreed with removing Saddam in 2003, we should be thankful we're not dealing with him and his two sons now. Saddam was himself deeply sectarian. As the latest research shows, the leadership of the regime was heavily sectarian, deliberately made so. And to those who think removing Saddam is the cause of the turmoil in the Middle East, and that there is some unbroken line between the removal of Saddam in 2003 and what is happening in Iraq today, I say the following. After the surge of 2007, Al-Qaeda was defeated and marginalized. In 2010, Iraq was relatively stable. It was in Syria. After the Arab Spring, when AQ became ISIS, headquartered in Raqqa, Syria where we failed to intervene, Syria the very opposite of the policy of intervention, where more people have died than in the whole of Iraq, with the worst refugee crisis since World War II and with no agreement as to the future. At least for all the challenges in Iraq today, there is a government actually fighting the terrorism and doing so with Western support, internationally recognized, including by Saudi Arabia and Iran, as the legitimate government, and with a prime minister welcome in the White House and in capitals across the globe. None of this excuses the mistakes we made. None of this excuses the failures. 
for which I repeat, I take full responsibility and apologize. But it shows that in the uncertain and dangerous world we live in, all decisions are difficult. Each has consequences predicted and unpredicted. And the only thing a decision maker can do is to take those decisions on, what, on the basis of what they genuinely believe to be right, and that is what I did. And the final passage, passage I will draw a few lessons from this conflict and then conclude and then take your questions for as long as you wish to ask them. So I was the Prime Minister in the period after 9-11 and through Iraq and Afghanistan. Since then I've spent the bulk of my time in the Middle East and studied the origins and character of Islamist extremism. What is clear is that this extremism is a global problem not confined to the well-known theatres of the Middle East or Pakistan or Afghanistan. It's across Africa, including Nigeria, Chad, Niger, Mali, Somalia, Asia, including the Philippines, Thailand and Bangladesh. It's in Central Asia. And of course, we have terrorist attacks here in Europe and in the United States. I've watched today's decision makers wrestle in Libya and Syria with the same types of dilemma I did. At a later time, I'll publish more detailed proposals about lessons from Iraq and other areas of conflict, but I'll summarize them briefly here. The first is that the danger of revolutional re regime change in any country where Islamism is likely to be a major factor is that once the dictatorship is removed, no matter how abhorrent, elements of extremism will move into the vacuum to cause chaos and instability. So unlike Kosovo, or indeed even Germany after World War II, the challenge becomes not one of reconstruction, but of security. Therefore, if possible, evolution or an agreed process of change is better than the overthrow of the existing order without agreement. That is why when the Arab Spring began, it would have been better to have tried to agree processes of transition in Libya and Syria so as to control the aftermath and make change without destroying stability. It would be sensible now as a precaution to invest in nation building in those parts of the world where we're plainly over time at risk of failed states collapsing and leading to further centers of extremism. Certain states in Africa are a clear example. Some parts of development age should be devoted to this. Second, where we've decided to intervene in a majority Muslim country, then we need to do so in a strong alliance with Muslim nations. Otherwise, we risk being accused, however unfairly, of intervening in those countries because they are Muslim and not because they represent a security or humanitarian threat. Third, the war waged by terrorist groups requires a completely different type of military strategy and capability from conventional warfare between nations. We now have huge experience of this from around the world. We need to construct the new doctrines and capabilities which allow us to do so effectively and with the right alliances within the West, within the Muslim world and between us. For us in the West, the pain of taking casualties in a fight that is often politically controversial and which does not involve defense of our own territory is now so great that we risk a situation where political leaders are reluctant to commit especially ground forces to combat. On the other hand, Western forces, particularly those of the United States and UK, have the most experience and the highest level of capability. This needs an act of consideration of whether we require a different level of volunteering for these missions. Otherwise, we're fighting without the best available forces to do the work. And for the UK, we have to have an active debate, including with our armed forces, about our desired levels of participation in such missions. Given that we will always be a partner, and in the case of the USA, a junior partner in terms of assets and capacity. Fourth, we can all agree in principle the UN is the right body to decide issues of international policy, including the justification for the use of force. But the reality is the UN is gridlocked effectively with Russia and USA regularly on different sides on similar issues. How can the UN be reformed? How can a clearer set of rules be agreed with a greater measure of objectivity? Fifth, we must understand the true nature of the threat we face. It is Islamist extremism and its ideology. And we need urgently to put in place a unified comprehensive strategy to defeat it. This should be a combination of hard and soft power, including a global commitment on education to reform education systems, the encouragement of modern mind and reformist clerics within Islam, and an effective countering of the propaganda of the extremists. 
and then we need an honest debate in the West about our own values and level of commitment to them. The West has a big decision to take. Does it believe it is a strategic interest in the outcome of the struggle in the Middle East and elsewhere around these issues of Islamist extremism? And if so, what level of commitment is it prepared to make to shape the outcome? My view is obviously that it does have such an interest and should make the necessary commitment. So in conclusion, many will find it impossible to reconcile themselves to the decision to remove Saddam or my motives in taking it. But it is vital we do not continue to allow controversy over Iraq to obscure what are real contemporary threats to world security, which reflect absolutely the difficulties we actually encountered in Iraq. This extremism menaces so many nations, those who were with us in Iraq and those who opposed Iraq, those of an aggressive foreign policy and those who have a Pacific one, developed and developing nations, North and South, wealthy and poor. This is the scourge of our time. It's the challenge of our generation. It requires us to act bravely, even when imperfectly. At some point, we will reach for and achieve the unified, comprehensive foreign and defense policy that can defeat it. Iraq will be a chapter in this struggle and an important one. But it wasn't the first and it won't be the last. I want to thank Sir John and his team for the report, for the time and care it has taken. I also want this day to pay tribute to Sir Martin Gilbert, who so tragically passed away before the report was concluded. We can't make decisions with the benefit of hindsight, but we can and we should learn from our experience and from the mistakes that were made. I hope future leaders can learn from those that I made so that our determination in confronting terrorism and violence is not less, but our ability to do so effectively is much greater. The decisions I made, I have carried with me for 13 years, and will do so for the rest of my days. There will not be a day of my life where I do not relive and rethink what happened. People sometimes ask me why I spend so much time in the Middle East today. This is why. That's why I work on Middle East peace, on the dialogue between faiths, on how we can prevent young people growing up with hatred in their hearts towards those who look, think or believe differently from them. It's my belief that if we learn the right lessons today, if we do, the next generation will see the dawn of a lasting peace in the place where all this began and where it must finally end, which is the Middle East. Thank you. Now